not doing as well. I had a gentleman tell me that his son, a grandson, actually graduated with honors with a 3.8 GPA and came to Del Mar one semester and barely had over a 1.5 GPA. And I was like, oh, this is something that we need to discuss. I don't expect that we'll have solutions, but I hope we have some ideas tonight as a collective that can move us forward and help us um, help us help our children and our um, students that are moving into higher education. So I want to go ahead and introduce the moderator. Our moderator is Reverend Christopher Hall. He's the pastor of the Pilgrim, Re Pilgrim Rest Missionary Baptist Church. And I'm biased because he's my pastor. <laughs> <laughs> he's my pastor. And so he's going to be the moderator. He's going to go through the questions. We're going to allow the panel to introduce themselves and say what they do and where they work and any other information they'd like to share and even a fun fact that you'd like to share about yourself. So I would like to introduce Pastor Hall. And also Pastor King gives the word of prayer. All right, if everybody can stand, we'll have a word of prayer and then we'll have one more. the panelists introduce themselves. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this evening. Lord, we thank you for this place that you have opened up, the doors you've opened and allowed us to come in. Father, we thank you, God, for all who are simply here tonight. Father, we pray right now that as we come together in your name, let everything be done for your glory, oh God, and for your kingdom building business. Father, now as we uh, gather on tonight, Father, we pray, oh God, that ideas, thoughts may come together uh, for the fruition of our young people, oh God, that we may come together for their benefit, oh God. We know that our foreparents and so many have paved the way and opened up doors. And Lord, we pray right now that that opportunity that is being presented to them, uh, let it not go undone. So Father, we thank you, we love you, and we give you glory. It's in your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right, panelists, uh, we will start if all of uh Ladies, will introduce yourselves first, and then gentlemen, y'all can introduce yourselves. Uh, starting right here on the end with Dr. Francis. Amen. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Tammy Francis. I'm an educator, strategist, consultant, author, and speaker. I help you move in the direction of more and prepare for what's next. And I'm also an associate professor of reading here at Del Mar College. I don't know why they have to go after you. Uh, my name is Simone Sanders. I'm the president of Taffy Corpus Christi. Also, I work for the Texas General Land Office for Commissioner Don Buckingham. I am the intergovernmental relations specialist for the coastal area. Um, besides that, I am also uh, founder and, and kind of speak out against different issues that we have going on in the community. Um, one thing that I like to spearhead and we've been spearheading as far as staff is concerned is Juneteenth and celebrating Juneteenth and what it means in Corpus Christi. Um, so that's basically good. Right. Hi everybody, I am Alice Shaw Hawkins. Um, I'm a retired public, public educator. I teach uh, here on the Del Mar campus. I've been here uh, since 1993. So I'm celebrating 20 years of being an instructor on this campus. I also sit on the library board of uh, Corpus Christi uh, Public Libraries. I am a trustee, board of trustee for eight years for Corpus Christi Independent School District. I serve on several other boards. I'm a member of a professional teachers organization. I am a product of Del Mar. Yes, I love that. Uh, and I grew up right over there, right down the, hall, right down the street here um, in Reynolds Edition. Um, and I'm basically a product of Corpus Christi in general. So thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Coretta Graham. I am an attorney. I'm a social justice advocate, community activist, and I serve currently as the president and CEO of Corpus Christi Black Chamber of Commerce. I forgot to say. 
say that I do believe that with the president, I'm the president of the League of Women Lords of Corpus Christi. I broke that glass ceiling. Woo! Yay. 78 years. <laughs> pastor Harry Williams, been struggling pastor for 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> Chief of the Police Department. I've been on the department for 23 years, uh, 10 years Navy. Uh, before that, so I've been in corporate since actually 96. So um, it's good to be here. I'm not a product of corporate, but uh, I haven't done as much as everybody else has done. So that <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started with the questions. Um, so again, you know, the, the, the the basis of tonight's town hall meeting is where are we heading? Um, and the, the framework for these questions is centered around education. Um, and so this is not some type of I got you or pointing the finger at somebody, but uh, coming together tonight, I believe this is the beginning of something, the genesis of something to where we can really uh, hone in on the struggle that our young people are having, not only in, in, in high school, but also in higher ed. So starting out uh, with Ms. Hawkins, uh, there's a mic down on your end down there. Um, so, Ms. Hawkins, where are we headed in K-12 higher education to decrease the number of casualties? Well, let's, let's just define casualties first. Uh, I would say um, dropouts, uh, students not completing higher ed. Uh, okay, well, just just speaking from a perspective of an instructor here for the last 20 years, um, we are headed downhill in terms of our black students and our black population. Um, in the 20 years that I have spent teaching 1301 uh, freshman composition, 1302 first com freshman composition, I think I can say I've had about five or six students to come through my tutelage. And out of those five or six, I think I can remember that I only had three that actually remained in the classroom and got a grade for being in the classroom. Every semester, I will end up with maybe one or two. And there are semesters that I don't have any African-American students. Uh, but when I do, after Two or three weeks, a month or so, they cease to participate. They don't come to class. They don't do their work. But it's not for a lack of, of opportunities. Delmar and uh, Mrs. Um, Cage knows. Delmar has gone over and beyond putting out services to help our students. And one of the things that I see that is detrimental to them not being successful is they won't seek the help. We have writing centers. I, as a, a, an instructor, just this year, they said we didn't have to post. Uh, office hours, but up until this past year, I had to actually post office hours for every class that I had. I would encourage students, come see me, call me. I even give students my phone number, and some people are like, you give your students, but I said, yes, I do, because I don't want any of my students to not be able to contact me if they have a question about the topic, 
about the assignment or anything that has to do with my class or my assignments. But I never get the call. And I think that part of that, and I tell my students, that part of that is our public education system. And I'm going to be real here. Part of the public education system is failing our students. And it's by design. Y'all know about the vouchers? We've had four, what, four callbacks on our vouchers. And we are being held hostage. Public education is being held hostage by not giving us money to support our schools and our students. No vouchers. No funding. And you can find that in any major newspaper that's reporting. So part of it comes from public schools. Part of it is on their own. And I would encourage parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, if you have a student that is enrolled in college, encourage them to seek the help. Encourage them to, we have a writing center that's designed to help people write any type of essay that they want to. Every single person that works in that writing center is a degree person. We don't hire people that are not degree, they are professionals. If students would seek the help, I do believe that we would see a better success rate than what we're seeing. So I don't, know, I don't know if I answered the question. Yes, and, and so this leads me to this. What do you think are some of the obstacles or roadblocks that are hindering students from seeking the help? Well, I, I think the, the very first thing that I think about when students don't seek help is they don't know how to study. Our students don't know how to study. For the last 10, 15 years, our students have been taught to the test. And every Superintendent will tell, oh, we don't teach the test. Yes, we do. When you stop reading novels in 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, and you go to several passages, and you are teaching students how to respond to that passage for the sake of passing a test, we are teaching to the test. I challenge you, any of you, if you got grandchildren, nieces, nephews, ask them what was the last novel that they read uh, in high school. And I can almost guarantee you, oh, we didn't read any novels. And I run into that every day in my classroom, right now. They, have, they, they don't have the ability to read. They don't know how to study. We talk about vocabulary in class, and I ask a question, I throw out a word, what's that mean? They're just sitting there looking at each other. They have a computer in their hands. And they will not scroll and go to Webster Dictionary online and type in the word and get the answer. So I think it's a lack of motivation. I think it's a lack of us pushing and pushing and pushing. Don't take no for your students and your nieces and your nephews. Keep pushing them to stay in school, get the help. If they tell you there is no help, call me up. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hawkins. Uh, Dr. Francis, same question. Where are we headed in K through, well, in, in higher education? I'll leave it at that. Where are we headed in our higher education to decrease the number of casualties? So I agree with uh, Ms. Hawkins. So I'm going to go from a different angle and add to that. I think the other piece is the way we look at credentialing. I think that we are tip used to the typical way of credentialing. You get a high school diploma, you get an associate degree. If you decide to go that route, you get a four-year degree. Now, micro-credentialing is very important, and that puts those little checkpoints, so to speak, in and success points. I'm sorry, whereas, but Dr. I don't mean to cut you off, but everybody may not be familiar with the term or the phrase credentialing. Could you explain? Diploma. Associate degree, bachelor's degree. I thought I said that, but just in case. All right. Um, so get those degree, those type of credentials, um, and that, that's the general term used because depending on if they want to do a certificate or they want to do a actual degree, it's credentialing. It's just getting that um, paper, as we like to say. So, um, 
So there, so that's one thing. I think now students have so many options. I remember growing up and it was, you go to school, you go to college, and you get to work, and that was it, right? We get it in that path. Now, with the emerging technologies and all the things that are happening, there's so many other options for students. So I think one of the ways that we need to do in public education, I don't know much about private or any other, so when I speak, I'm only talking about my experience, my 24 years in public education. Um, we are, education is always behind. Education is always the last to change and shift. And I think one of the things that we have to look at is how we are structuring the educational um, out of levels, for lack of a better term, elementary, middle school, high school, college, university, um, and how we structure those and how we are, what type of curriculum we're offering to students that are really making them prepared for the future. I think a lot of what we do in education is antiquated, and therefore we lose a lot of students who are not engaged and or can see the relevance to their life. So I think, one, we have to think about the future of work. We have to think about how this looks as far as credentialing. Should we be offering more micro-credentialing? I think now, with the age of video and instant gratification, students need more checkpoints in saying, yes, I completed that. Yes, I completed that. And then it adds up to that associate's degree. It adds up to that bachelor's degree. So I think in just the way public education is structured and organized, that transmission model, I teach, you listen, that's no longer um, working. It hasn't been working forever, but now it's really not working. Um, and it's more evident. So I think we lose students to this traditional quote unquote system. So I think those are some of the things that we should consider um, it should be considered in education, and that's one of the things that I advocate for in the spaces I occupy um, as far as education. And it's very difficult to get people to see, like, it's time for us to be innovative and think about what is a part of our degree plan? What are the courses we're offering? How are they offered? There are some teachers and professors that have been teaching for 30 years, and they've taught one class 30 years. <laughs> one class, they haven't done any innovation, any changes in their curriculum. And so I think, you know, all those things, you know, we always say the students to students or the teachers to teachers, but I really think it's just really the system and how it's structured. And I think there are, there are so many things, and I'm a curriculum and instruction, in case you don't know that, that's my area. So I really think about the layers of curriculum, the hidden curriculum, the taught curriculum, the recommended and suggested curriculum, um, all of those, the tested curriculum, which Ms. Hoff has talked about, um, all of those things. And I think we need to look at all aspects of it. Thank you. All right, this uh, next couple of questions is for uh, Taffy and NAACP. Um, so if if you would please start out with Taffy, would you please give us your mission? Uh, what is what is the mission of Taffy? Ooh, you would ask me that. Um, <laughs> Um, Taffy is a 501c3 statewide nonprofit with different chapters across the state of Texas. But our main mission and focus and goal is to assist African American students, educators, staff members uh, to make sure that they have a quality of education, uh, life at the university, or, or education period. Um, that, that's what we focus on. That's our main mission and goal. So anything that pertains to achieving that mission, that's what we plan to do. And, and, and what type of impact has Taffy had on um, the, the community that it serves? Um, I, I think we've had a positive impact. And just to go into what Tammy said and, and what's been stated before, um, even when they're speaking about it, um, we know there's a lack of foundation as far as what's being taught and what's being done. And I just personally think that we might have been on a downhill slope before, but I think COVID further impacted that. And these kids now are into instant gratification. So what we do is we try to make sure and see how are we playing catch up to fix a problem, which is what usually happens with the system. Um, coming behind the scenes, you failed TSI testing, and now here we are trying to help you and make sure you have some hands-on experience to see why you're failing these tests. 
Um, that's what we do is it's usually we're called in after there's been a problem and we try to help fix that problem or situation. Thank you. All right, uh, same for NAACP. Uh, what is the mission of the NAACP? So our mission is, uh, our, mission and, our mission and vision, and now we have a strategy mission so somewhat which is a little bit much simpler but overall is to ensure the political educational the social um, equities are applied and now just recently this past year it did not say the word black people in our mission statement but now they've made it real clear to say said persons of color but black people and ensure that our communities would thrive so that is the mission of the our national and for every child. Okay. And then um, what are the organization's objectives towards education? So you've kind of heard some background on where we are with K through 12 and then in higher ed. So how would the NAACP be able to impact uh, those issues? Sure. So two years ago at the State of the Union at uh, Texas A&M University, Dr. Miller and her State of the Union, if you all went or listened, uh, she stated African American men are not attending college and are not graduating. It kind of blew me away. She said that in her, you know, her, in her speech. And so afterwards, we, we talked a little bit and she made it real clear uh, you know, Mr. Coleman, we need your help. So, what do we do? What do we need to do to get it? And after discussion, for about two or three days, black men are not reading, don't know how to read. Now that's from studies that she's had her professors do and compile over a certain amount of years. And then the next question came, where, where do we start at? Where do we start? So last year, um, our chapter decided that we were going to do a, the power of reading a project and identify certain schools, which we have done. Um, we went to our national convention. Uh, they had uh, a lot of the books that have been banned, you know, from libraries, like, I don't know, Kill, and, Kill a Mockingbird, To Kill a Mockingbird. That book has been banned. But at the national convention, they had stacks of them and direct contact to vendors who had them. So this year, we're going to pull all those books together with the help of AFT, Dr. Nancy Gutter, is getting retired teachers together and partnering with the university to identify those students. And there may be some who don't fit in that category, but start with them reading. Um, it was interesting today when I was at Driscoll doing the uh, Black History, um, I guess I'm a little old school. I took, I made copies of, you know, handouts and handed my kids like, what are you doing with this worksheet? And it didn't click on to me when I am hearing Dr. Uh, Tammy saying, you know, they're used to being on the computers and looking up. So then I caught myself and I asked the teacher, oh, can they have their cell phones out? You know, I can take them to the national website. And he said, no, let them use the paper. It's like, oh, okay. And as they were going through, um, I, I have no cell phone policy on my campus. Well, your teacher obeyed it, sir. He did it. He did it. As we were going through, the students were, uh, there were three, three girls and one gentleman sitting in the back. And I realized as they were going through, and we were reading some of the things, that they were just real simple. What year was an ACP founded? 1909. And then when I, I listed on there, uh, can someone read out what it says? And as they started reading, I could tell, uh, I guess the word is phonics, you know, your vowels using that, I could tell some of them could not pronounce those words. And it just took my mind right back to what Dr. Miller, Dr. Miller said. So to answer your question, we're partnering with a &M University, and this year um, that, that's going to kick off. And three CSAS elementary schools, two middle schools, and we haven't got to the high schools yet. It's going to really feel it's in the elementary and middle schools where it's going to make the most impact. And, and I'm going to add to that, and, and uh, Dr. Francis, uh, Ms. Hawkins, and uh, uh, President Coleman, y'all can jump in and answer on this. So in, in, in looking at some of the data that CCSD uh, it's, it's preliminary, 
all of the schools on the west side, from elementary up to middle school, all the way up to the high school level, are either in orange or red. And you know, anytime anything gets orange or red, it's it's not positive. Uh, but yet, still going from the central side of town, going up to the south side, most of those schools are green and blue. So, in looking at that, um, where are we headed? Because we know, as 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 you know, President Cohen has just just stated, it's not just at at, at Driscoll, but at, at many other campuses. A lot of these students they are having a hard time reading while they're in first, second, third grade. And and so, where are we headed? I mean, what can we do as a community to help these these babies before they even get to the middle schools? One of the things that CCISD has uh, invested in, and I've been a part of that for the last two or three years, is we have beefed up our pre-K program. And research and every educator in here knows that if a child is not reading by third grade, he or she is destined to fail. Uh, we learn to read up through third grade. We read for information after third grade. And part of the issues are in lo the low socioeconomics. The socioeconomics has a lot to do with our children not being able to read. Part, a lot of it has to do with single uh, family, uh, single parent families. Uh, I'm not gonna put all of that on the single parent because my sister and I were raised by a single parent. Uh, but socioeconomics plays a lot in our children reading. Many of our parents don't take or have the opportunity to send their children to pre-K. Uh, because it, it, up to this point, it has been almost um, unaffordable to send children to pre-K if you don't have some kind of stipend from the state government. Uh, but we all know also that the prisons, the prison system, and I'm not telling uh, educators this, they know this, but the prison systems are, have been studied and designed through third grade. They look at third grade scores across the, the state, depending on how many children can read by third grade that determines how many prisons they are going to build. That is how they get their metrics. So, and, and so many people don't understand and know this. So if we are working toward helping our pre-K children learn to know their colors, uh, can cite the ABCs, count to 10 or 20 or 100, before they get to three years old, they have a chance. Anything past that is, it, by the time they get to that, those kindergartners have already exceeded that. So when you get these pre-K that have not been trained, have not been taught, do not have that, uh, that um, help at home, then those children then are destined to fail. And if we don't do something about that, then we have a problem. Now, CCIC has put in place pre-K at every school. Every elementary school, we have a pre-K program. And it is based on some that some of the parents have to pay based on their salaries and what they bring home. Other children who are in the lower socioeconomics don't have to pay. But we are trying to get our children ready to go to kindergarten. And once they get to kindergarten and they have sat in those classrooms, and it's an all day program, these are not half days. Um, they sit in those, those classrooms, they are taught, they are taught discipline, they're taught the numbers, the colors, they're taught to behave, they're taught to raise their hands. All of the things that many of our children on the south side whose parents pay for pre-K uh, uh, training 
or they send their kids to some kind of a program, they go and they have a leg up on the rest of our children. So part of that problem that we have is we need to start making sure, and not just here in Corpus, but across the nation, that our young children get the proper training before they get into kindergarten because that is where things really begin to happen. They have expectations from the kids in kindergarten. So if they can learn to read by the time they get to third grade, they have a background and a foundation from the pre-K and the kinder program going into elementary and that is going to help them. Once a student is successful, they taste success, they really do love it. But many of them have not had that taste of success, and so therefore, they feel out like a fish out of water. And many of them, I sat in the classrooms, I know, if they have a problem learning, they're gonna get attention, but it's gonna be negative. They're gonna be disruptive. They're gonna talk, they're gonna walk, they're gonna do things against the rules of the classroom because they cannot perform academically. And so we have to have an opportunity to get our children up to snuff, like the Southside kids or kids whose parents are making six figures uh, on an annual basis. But it's not about the fact that the kids don't have money, it's they don't have opportunity. And that opportunity is what keeps them there. And we need to be better. Thank you. We need some more misfugases in our community. <laughs> All right, uh, moving on, uh, Chief Sanders. Uh, thank you all to, uh, to educators. Uh, what, what, why are community outreach and education uh, important? Part of building a great relationship with law enforcement. Uh, it's, it helps build that positive familiarity uh, with us. And I think a lot of times too, it's always, it's always negative, you know. Um, a lot of the interactions, a lot of things that the kids are seeing in the 30-second clip, it's, it's, it's always negative. And so if they keep getting these addictive, you know, feeds to turn their head constantly, constantly, they're gonna always think that. So what we try to do is just, we just try to be intentional about being out in the community, making sure that we're out there making, uh, you know, giving out badges and having positive, uh, you know, interactions with kids. That's how I became a police officer. Me and my friends were running around the neighborhood, getting in trouble, and there was this one officer that used to always come around and stop and talk to us. And, you know, sometimes we had rocks in our hands, and, you know, as we were talking to him behind our back, you know, but we, he, he, was, uh, he, he was intentional about, you know, making sure that he knew it, but hey, be good, it's to, you know, parent. Hey, we didn't have any choice about the chores and stuff, but, uh, you know, but he, he just, he made it a positive interaction. And so that pushed me towards the Explore program. That pushed me toward ultimately deciding I wanted to do this. So, um, you know, I don't know if I didn't have that positive interaction with, with him uh, coming up. I don't know why I'd be here. So we just have to be intentional about doing that and, and staying con consistent with it. Just can't be like a tax break. You know, preacher and do it. So does the department have a program similar to that? As I can remember back in the late 70s, you know, we had Officer Friendly here in, in, in our community. And it wasn't at the high school level like the uh, Explorers program, but this was at the elementary level. So does the department have anything on that level uh, that kind of relates or similar to what you described or someone like Officer Friendly? In my, in my opinion, it, it, all officers should be friendly. And so, well, so, 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 <laughs> so I'm going to go back. So, Officer Friendly, he was a police officer with CCPD, and he went into the elementary schools and, and built those relationships uh, with, you know, the elementary students. So, and, and you know, but y'all had somebody in y'all's neighborhood that actually did that. And you're right, all officers should be friendly because, believe it or not, there are still people walking around thinking that George Floyd, that whole incident was a sham and was fake. Um, but to ask to, 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 to answer the question, I mean, do, does the department have something similar to that? We do have an explore program, like you said, but we, we don't. And I, I think we're kind of getting away from that, you know. And then the kids got used to seeing one person all the time. And then what do they think about the rest of us? So 
in my opinion, I, I'm, I'm serious. I think they should look at all of us the same. We all need to be out there practicing it and, and doing it. Because I want them, when they see this, not necessarily this or who I am, when they see the uniform or the patch or the, the badge, that we, it should be a positive interaction. So I think we're kind of getting away from that model uh, to have where one person's going out all the time. And, you know, they see that person, and then that's the only person they grew up knowing. knowing. So it, I think it should be all of us. I know when my uh, son was in high school, they had a police officer based there at that school. And the children really took to this female police officer. And she was instrumental in diffusing a lot of situations that could have gone left that didn't. And I mean, she was wonderful in high school. Do they still have that available in the high school throughout Corpus? So I can, I, I can answer that question. So every CCSD campus, uh, even at the elementary level, start out that has uh, a CCISD police officer, not a CCPD officer. Um, and the, the, the foundation or the skill set of those officers is to build those relationships with students first. Um, unfortunately, that's not always the case. Uh, it doesn't always happen like that, uh, but that is the, the, the premise for those officers being there on the campus. And they're CCISD officers. Yes, ma'am. But they are trained through Every, every officer has to go through the same training, correct me if I'm wrong. They have to go through the same training, but they're not our police officers. Uh, but yes, they, they all have to be certified through the state. They're paid by the district. Yeah, they're paid by the district. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Chief Sanders. All right, we're going to move to uh, business. Um, let me see who do I have here. Uh, Ms. Graham. What is the main purpose of the? Did I miss something? The, what is the main purpose of the Corpus Christi Black Chamber? Uh, basically, I can sum it up in three terms: advocacy. Well, more than three terms, but three different areas, I should say: advocacy, business development, economic empowerment. Uh, like access to capital. And a lot of times people don't understand that we are 501c6, we're a business organization, we're an organization of businesses and business professionals, mostly businesses. So our focus is on helping to grow um, in various ways this economic economy that exists here in Corpus Christi, because if we don't grow it, it will die. It will go by the wayside. If we're not pop, if we're not actively striving to push current businesses to, to stay in the course, helping businesses that may be performed in less than five years, and then helping people who want to start a business so they can add to this black economy. All right, and staying with the thread of our discussion tonight, what resources or information can the Chamber provide to help improve education in our community? Um, we can provide education about what it takes to start a business, and we've started that already. Um, we've partnered with the small U.S. Small Business Administration to have office hours particularly for Black-owned businesses, so they know if you need serious money from through the government, these are the things you need to have in place before you even step to them, because because these are the things they're going to require. Um, we started, um, and we have a small business forum this Saturday, but we're starting to do these small business forums typically geared toward Black-owned businesses so that we can have a conversation about how do we traverse this particular landscape, this particular community, and to be successful, not just survive in it, but actually thrive as a business. So we're starting to basically do a lot of, we've done over the past 80 years, but in particular the last three, a lot of business development. We have our Monday Motivations, uh, membership meetings, 
that is open not only to members, but anyone who wants to hear information that's pertinent. Uh, this last one's on marketing, because that's a big issue with a lot of business. They start a business, but they don't know how to market it. And it's something like, you, you need to understand this needs to be part of your budget. If you want to be successful, you need to know how to grow your clientele, grow your customer base. We recognize every young leader, young entrepreneurs, those young kids under 25 that are in business, and we try to help them, help their parents, help keep them motivated. Um, so we, got, we do a lot of things like that, and we support other organizations, like the NLSB, like Taffy, who are doing uh, the work in the community. That's not necessarily our mission, but we recognize that there's a partnership, there's a collaboration, because we need to take a village, and we're trying, and we, for some reason, we, I don't know if we got away from that concept, but that's like an, an African concept that we need a village of people to help raise our children in whatever, in the different various aspects. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to the question one more time before you pass the mic. So, I heard you speak on the a certain age level, but talking about our our high school students and, and, and our college students, um, what can we do as a Black Chamber of Commerce to help help those students? And you know, looking at it at, at the high school level, I know there is a career and technology program at every single high school. How can the Black Chamber of Commerce insert ourselves into those? Uh, high school programs uh, to maybe help because I, I talk to young people a lot and, and I hear them say that I want to, you know, have my own hair shop, I want to have my own salon shop. Um, do they know what it takes? Because I asked them, do you know what it takes? I mean, you, you might start out renting from somebody. And don't just don't just stop at rent, but you want to make sure that you know that you can go out and buy your own building. So um, what are we doing to help promote educate our young people uh, that are looking to be entrepreneurs and business owners. Um, we, last year we started our Black Wealth Summit, and that's, I mean, all our programs, most of them are open to the public. We tried to add a youth component to try and get young people in there to do financial literacy. They need to understand money. Right. <laughs> but, you know, that's always this challenge. If you invite us to come, and partner with you to do a presentation, we will do it. You know, we we went, we got asked to participate in a uh, homeschooling event for Black History Month at the Museum of Science History. So we said, okay, who wants to go and represent the chamber, talk about, you know, different uh, Black figures in our history, and emphasize a Black business owner, you know, you know, throw that business in there. But we will partner with anyone who wants, you know, you doing something with, you know, uh, for a career day, we can definitely come in, partner with you to educate people about, you know, starting a business. You know, business one-on-one and, you know, we partner with banks because a lot of them have financial literacy programs already, but, you know, We'll partner with anyone who wants us to come in and help and provide that information. It's just a matter of just letting us know. Thank you so much, Dr. Francis. I see you had the mic when you put it down. <laughs> I did, because she mentioned it, because I was going to say, you know, um, get the youth thing. So I was trying to tell Ron what she said, and she got there, so we're good. <laughs> All right. And then moving along, uh, Pastor Williams. How can we engage the community in education, being a former school board member and a, a current pastor in the city? How can we as a church uh, engage community in education? Well, let me just tell you about uh, being an octogenarian now. <laughs> <laughs> This is, <laughs> this is all quite troubling to me, uh, coming from where you know, I come from, and the emphasis that was placed on education, and then that education was your key to success, and even though my mom had a third grade education, she had a desire to you. Get that education, and 
There used to be a connection between home, church, and school. We had that connection. You are teachers, our parents, you are teachers, and if something happened, uh, word got around and they uh, care of, you were taken care of, and the situation was fixed. We've lost that. We don't have that connection anymore. Our communities are no longer intact. And so that support system. What, um, what I did at Mount Lyon was to recognize every child in the church at every level. If you cannot be an A student, be a B student or a C student. And uh, if you are not a C student, what did, did you attend school every day? What was your attendance? And at every level, you know, reward them for what they did to you. And we would recognize them, give them coins, and recognize them for what they did. And I would let them know, I'm coming to So there was a person that called, and I would go on their school campuses, and I would go to their teachers, and I would say to them, if you need any help with Jackie, <laughs> let me know. Okay? And so they knew that. And so we have to realize that, as Coretta said, we have to get back to the business. And as, as black people, we have to look out for black kids, okay? Because ain't nobody else gonna do it, right? You're right. We, yeah, we gotta look out for our, because they're looking out for theirs. We've gotta look out for ours because they're the most vulnerable mm. to begin with. And so we've got to do that. We've got to have that safety net. And so uh, I encourage pastors to do that in their churches, recognize those children, uh, let them know that somebody is looking, somebody is concerned. Where there is a sense of caring, children will try to live up to that mm -hmm. if there is an expectation. If there is no expectation, okay? And so that, the other thing, And I think that we've got to try to help the same kids uh, in spite of parents. And but they need to know that there is a connection between what they do in that classroom and how they fare later on in life. Why are you here? Okay. I took my students, uh, my church kids, I took them to New Orleans. Just those trips, taking kids out of their environment, letting them see something else. The girl who went to, because I took them to uh, Bayou Plaza in New Orleans, and the fact that they were able to go there and see something else, one of them decided, I'm coming back here, and I'm going to school here. She went to Dillard University. Orleans, graduated, received her doctorate at the age of 32. Okay. But it came out of that trip. Same thing in Burberry. To see the possibilities, Dr. Tracy Johnson today, when she went to Burberry and saw what could be, she came back with the determination to get educated. So what I'm saying to you is that we have got to be personally involved in the lives of these children. We've got to let them know we care. We've got to do things to show that and we've got to show the relevance and information to their education. You 
need to do this because your life depends on it. And I used to tell children in my church, your brain is your bank. Okay? If you don't put anything in the bank, you are going to write checks and it doesn't come back bouncing because there ain't nothing out there. And so you've got to put something in here so you can make it with gold. And so uh, we've got to get back to that, that sense of community, that sense of I totally agree, and, and I'm, I'm going to add to that um, because our communities have been disbanded here in, in in the city. There is no Hillcrest. There is no North Side of what we remember and how it used to be. And and, and looking at where our students are and, and looking at families, even the the family connection is it's it's not the 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 more uh, fiber of our families is not what it used to be. Um, and I, I totally resonate and understand what you're talking about because my grandmother, you know, she had a third grade education, but uh, it was her who really like motivated me and gave me the option to really get my education because I watched her and I saw her struggle and I was like, you know, this is not for me. Um, but in, in looking at that and adding to that past Williams, I had this conversation with Chief Sanders just uh, last night, and then uh, Ms. Hawkins and I kind of touched on it. It's going to take the entire village to get into our schools and come together for the sake of our black kids. Because if we don't, we're going to continue down this path with these numbers that when these kids do, and my wife, she's the teacher at Bill Martin. And, and had the same struggle. These kids were graduating from high school but could not write a freshman composition paper. And if, if we do not get in and fill in the gap for these families that have been broken, for these students who are struggling to read and, and pass the TSI math test, those requirements that it takes to get to the higher ed level, if we don't step in at an early age and, and take them on the trips, like, it's enough of us in here right now to pull 20 students together and take them on a trip and let them know and introduce them to what college life could look like. As a former uh, coach here in the community, that was one of my things. I wanted to get these kids out of Corpus Christi. Every opportunity I had, we were going to go to Houston, to the Woodlands, to this track meet when I go on to Robstown. You have to know there's something bigger and better out there waiting on you. Ms. Wooten and Ms. Hawkins know what I'm talking about. I mean, well, I had to get them out of Corpus Christi because that's all they knew. And because they were stuck here in the city, they thought they were all, all of that. I said, no, baby, let me go show you. And But right now, our families are not what they used to be. But that's, that's no excuse for us not stepping in and filling in the gap, coming together. And, and I believe that this meeting tonight, it is the genesis of, of something big to help my students when they get to the higher ed, as they are not struggling to be successful. I mean, there is no way we have 400 black students here at Del Mar with that type of GPA. And my daughter's on that list. One, one of my daughters is on that list. Thank God she's not one of the 400, because she knows better. <laughs> But we have a responsibility to promote education because going back and, and, and Pastor Williams, you hit the nail on the head. That, that, that was our way out. Because our, our four parents, they didn't have that opportunity. And I had, to, I had an opportunity to share this with a, a group of students at, at Veterans Memorial just, just Tuesday night about the struggle that even my parents went through. And I told them, I said, I'm not that far removed from the struggle. I just told them a little more this morning. I grew up in a shotgun house on, on, on Waco Street, across from Coles, uh, two, two houses down from St. Matthew. And I said, if I can make it with the help of God, so can you. I said, I grew up on the side of town. I said, I said I'm no different from, from you. But if, 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 if we do not come together now, and really start to get into these schools and unify to help these kids. I mean, it's it's going to get worse. Yes, sir. Yeah, Paul, I really appreciate what Pastor Lynn said, and we know 
And, and, and I was getting ready to hit on that, uh, President Cohen, if you don't mind, just real quick. We are going to have to get into the schools because these kids are not in churches. They are not. In, so we can't wait for them to come to the church. we got to go to them. Go ahead, President Cohen. What I was going to say is that uh, at the beginning, uh, Ms. Sanders and Dr. Brown mentioned programs that they are offering for free for the, you know, to the community. Uh, and I'm pretty sure uh, that if we took those resources, um, like the math training that they had, the, the, the tutoring and the literacy programs, or even what Pastor Harry Williams is doing in his church, and for those who are not in church, go out and reach out into the schools and maybe even take it a step further and really you know, advertise it and push it through your black uh, organizations say hey, we need to pull in who do you know that we can pull in we know miss cage and we know uh, pastor hall have a list of students who are failing we is it possible for us to make contact with these students and get, get connected with them i was listening to you uh pastor hall i mean pastor uh, williams and i thought about one thing i clearly remember there being uh many African American principals. I remember Sid Gardner and Vernon Portis and Reese Portis and Mr. Bell. Every level I went through, uh, it seemed like there was a black principal on those campuses. And I just truly believe that makes somewhat of a difference. That our, I'm, I'm speaking of black students here, okay? That's what I, I'm, I'm referencing. That we're losing some of our black students in the college level, the 400 y'all referred to and also in their reading and also in their in their math uh, skills somehow some way and i mentioned this to dr anonymous at ccisd what are you doing to recruit black administrators black teachers black dean of instructions where they can be seen on those campuses and we can build those connections in one survey that was done last year by the national NAACP regarding education and the failure rate and the slipping and going from you know from high school straight to prison what was the disconnect so they did a study they had black teachers and a few hispanic and maybe asian teachers on on one level with a group of students and then they had all anglo teachers on one level with a group of students and so as they transitioned the students out they didn't tell them which rooms to go to. They just said, you can choose whatever room you go to, same material, same information, playing games, whatever they're going to do in those rooms. And just about all the black students out of the 1,300 that were there uh, overall, maybe the, the 650 black, black students went and gravitated towards all the rooms where the black educators were. And it made a big difference in them building that, that, that relationship. I just think, sir, to go back to answer your question that there are resources here, maybe we need to do a better job of really pushing it and putting it out there. Um, I know I see the math resources that are there. I mean, our church takes advantage, at least our, uh, at least St. John, and you know, it is emphasized. Uh, Taffy has a math course that's going on on Saturdays, and they really push it. Now, we hear it. We need to take the initiative uh, for those who are maybe not as you know doing it as like Pastor Williams and Hall and, and maybe other churches that are doing it. Those that are not, we need to take the initiative and lock in with these institutions that are doing it, so our kids can have what they need. And and, and, and President Cohen, I'm going to hit on something you mentioned real quick because this is really the reality of where we are with education right now. 
I'm in a position to where I go out on job fairs and, and recruit staff members and teachers. And I can speak from all the way from San Marcos all the way down to the valley. When I go to these job fairs, the pool of black candidates, it is extremely limited. Our young people are, are no longer interested in being an educator. And so if there's nobody in the pool, there's nobody to choose from. Uh, I'd just like to also say, uh, in reference to your question, um, I know that this, the children aren't coming to, going to church any longer. I know this. That is a fact. And this is not just limited to black churches. This is limited to, this is churches nationwide, um, all, all denominations. The church is no longer relevant in the lives of our people. So, we have a saying in education, you meet the child, the child where he or she is. You don't try to go higher and try to beck them to you. You go where they are and you work with them and bring them up. And so to answer your question, I think that we, if we really want to reach our children, and we're not talking about those whose parents are taking them to church and, 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 uh, and all of the ministers that are here, Y'all know who your young people are, but we need to be mentors to kids that have no mentor. We need to connect with counselors and find out uh, to what extent we can because of FERPA laws, there's a lot that we are, are limited to learning. But we can offer ourselves up as mentors to children and be willing to meet with those children uh, on a weekly basis, encourage them, holidays, uh, give them a present or take them to some event um, and, and recognize them and encourage them and let them know. Even all of us have a story to tell up here, every one of us. And uh, it's not all a success, success, success. So we know what it took for us to be successful. And we can pass those things on by way of encouraging them. So I think that maybe if there is some type of a coalition that's put together uh, and we are cleared through the campuses or through the educational system such that we can offer ourselves up as mentors. And I know that uh, there's another organization that actually does mentor young people. There are ways to tap into these young people and find out where they, let's find out where they are, be a mentor, I mean, and be loyal to that child. Because many of them have not experienced that. Many of them have been tossed aside by a parent or their, one of the parents is locked up or not in the family. All of these are the ones that we really need to reach and encourage them, let them know they're important, their lives are important, and most of all, that without this educational piece in their lives, that they will be on the bottom end, what we call bottom feeders. And, and I tell people all the time, I didn't know when I was getting an education, I was talking the talk. I'm getting me an education so I don't have to work so hard. And I'm, I just want to tell you a little quick story um, to uh, augment this. My mom used to take me, I don't know, I don't even remember what my sister was doing. She, she wouldn't go. But on Saturdays, my mom would take me to the houses that she cleaned. And during the summer, she would take me two or three days out of the week, come on, you're going over and help me at Miss So-and-so's house. The minute we hit the door, she started barking orders, okay, get in there, clean the toilet, and then I want you to mop the floors. And one day I rose up and I said, I don't want to be cleaning Miss Susie's house for the rest of my life. I was upset. And I was probably 10, 11 years old, and I knew that, that I should probably be picking myself up on the floor by saying that back then. But my mother was a wise woman. She didn't get her feathers ruffled. She heard, she let me pop off.
talk about Lois. And when I got done, she just said, well, if you don't want to be doing this, you better get, you, get an education. And that was the genesis of me understanding that I needed to move on. And so all of my life, I have been grateful for what my education has done for me and allowed me to do. And so we need to give these gifts from us to these youngsters and let them understand that we are here for them. We don't want to have to pop them upside the head because we don't do that anymore because they'll pop back. But, but we need to encourage them and continue to pour into them good stuff and, and, and let that overflow and maybe some of that negativity that has been put into them will come out in the wash and they will begin to have faith in themselves and, and, and experience success. But mentoring is also another way for us to reach our children that we are losing and have lost. And I just want to add when she said continue to pour into them. So I'm going to be an advocate at this moment. Um, I think that a lot of the research talks about read by third grade, everything is by third grade, but it is, yes, it's given us information, but it's also been a detriment to our community. Because once they hit third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, if we don't see that light, if we don't see them doing what we think they should be doing, some of us discard them and say, oh, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. I've seen it, I've, I've been to secondary, I'm not an elementary person, because I advocate for the second year. Because I think that at some point, we give up. And when I when I, when I was growing up, that didn't happen. Our family, whether you were doing something illegal, whatever, people still tried to get you on the right path, on the right path. And I think a lot of what I see, and I hear from students, from their word, from their voices, is, you know, my mom doesn't care. Um, my, these other teachers don't care is because at some point they stopped and I'm in higher ed and I know teaching non-traditional students for 24 and older that there's always hope and so I think it's, and it's about them seeing that in you, in us, right? It's seeing that there is hope and there is possibilities and those opportunities we've been talking about, the access making sure all of that is available to them. So I do think that's a component. We always want to target elementary. I'm, a, I'm so for that, I'm not saying not do that. But I also know that a lot of things are targeted toward elementary, but they're not thinking about, there's some people who will, who will have casualties that are not reached in elementary. So are we doing something in middle school, in high school, and at the community college or the university to help those students? Or in the community when they've dropped out, if they're GED, if they're doing something else in the community, what are we doing for those students? Because I think we have all these programs at the lower levels, but we forget some of the upper levels of some of the students, and we give up on them because they're now in the quote-unquote system. They've now been arrested. They have a record and all these things. But um, what I know from my experience and all the lives that I've seen turn around, or they have that spark like, wait a minute, I can do something else. Maybe traditional education is not their thing because some of the smartest students or dropouts because they, they don't conform to the structure of a traditional classroom, class to class, eight to four, but they, they're very smart. And so sometimes it's entrepreneurship, it's business that they need to go in. There's other things. And so I think we need to also look at the those older students, those uh, older adults um, who are falling through the cracks, who are casual, we quote unquote call casualties, because I think there's something there for us to do for them as well. Thank you, Dr. Francis. Uh, so on that note, I'm going to end with these two things. I deal with young people every day, and I clearly remember a young man that I had last year at my high school. His mom gave up on him. This, this young man was homeless, found him behind a trash can off a lever, feeding him and, and, and living, trying to take care of himself. Our young people, they have lost trust in the adults in their lives closest to them. Because they've lost trust, then it's hard for them to get into the education system and trust adults who they have no connection with. So all that being said, we have a collaboration, we have a team here. 
that can come together right now to the to, to tonight and help our young people that are out there right now who are in need. They are in need. And, and I'll tell you, there's three things that the low social economic or the admin student is, is really wanting. They may say they don't want it, but it's, it's motivation, boundaries, and relationships. They may say they, they don't they don't want structure, but they, they want structure. They need motivation. They need those positive relationships in their life. So thank you, uh, Sister Beverly Cage, for this opportunity. I'm going to turn it back over to you for closing remarks. Thank you all. Let's give our panelists a hand tonight.